My goodness, look at the time. It's time for another part in the SDL C++ 2D platformer RPG series. Hey everybody, my name is Marty and this is part five. In last episode, we rendered a texture using SDL and in this episode, we're gonna create ourselves an entity class. So with that said, the sun isn't shining, the birds aren't chirping, winter's still here. It's such a beautiful day for programming. There's still snow on the ground and, and every time there's a warm day and I get start feeling hope rise up in me that maybe winter has come to an end and maybe spring is coming. Winter just has to dash that into a billion pieces. You, you'll go, you'll have a nice warm day, nice warm day, nice warm, and then bam, freezing cold day. It taunts me and mocks me. I just, it's just laughing. I can't take it anymore. It's pushed me to the edge. It's pushed me too far. It's time for a day of retribution against winter. I can't seem to find the to blowtorch because, well, the shed's a mess as usual. But that's okay. I'll just use these matches. Now, if we do this right, just gotta, just get this patience game, you know? Uh, come on. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's alive. Take that snow. Die. Die, winter. Come on, spring. I'm helping you out, bud. Die, snow. Die. Take that out, out. Yeah, that's a work in progress. We'll get back to that. But so let's open up our SDL project file. If you remember, you just right click on the sublime dash project, right click, open with other application or just open with sublime text, either one. Click that and then that will open up sublime text. So maximize that, go over to tools and then select build system and make sure you have it set to deb debug. I have it set to release for some reason, but I don't know why. So make sure it's deb debug and then hit F7 just to make sure it works, which it does. So right now we were rendering a grass texture to the screen and we're just saying, all right, SDL, fill the entire window go into source along the side click it and then double click on main.cbp and double click on renderwindow.cbp go into include and double click on renderwindow.hpp so open up all these files this is what we're going to be working on today so so far if we check out renderwindow.cpp our actual render call takes in a texture as a parameter so in main.cbp we actually pass our textures our texture pointers such as grass texture to our window with window.render and then we send it like so. So we're going to take that a step further and create an entity class that essentially just wraps around the texture, describes to the renderer where this should actually be rendered, if there should be any transformations like rotations or shears, things like that, or scaling. Now in render window.cbp, if we go back there, you'll notice that the SDL render copy call that actually renders our textures into a image that can be displayed to the screen had two empty parameters or two null pointers passed as parameters. Now these here are actually the viewable portions of the texture. This first one describes how big the actual source of the texture is, then this one describes the actual destination, so any scaling or transformations we want to apply to it. Because of this, we can actually say, hey, uh, only draw this section of the texture or draw the section at this coordinate on the screen. So if we compile this with F7 and we run it, we'll see that this isn't running quite the way we want it because it's filling the entire screen. What we actually want this to be doing is only, we only want this to be a 32 by 32 texture because that's what it is. To do that, we have to create two things, which are SDL, so tab it over, SDL underscore rect. Now an SDL underscore rect is a structure. We'll get into structures and classes in a second here. And it has four members and that's X position, Y position, width, and height. SDL rect, and we're gonna call this pump cutting in and out is gonna be, uh, I tell you, if it's not one thing, it's another. Recording this video is uh, wonderful. We're gonna call this one SRC. So SRC stands for a SDL rect that represents the actual size of the texture. There goes the pump again. See that eye twitching? That's not supposed to happen. So what we do is, is we go source, source.x equals zero, and then source.y equals zero, comma, and then source.width. So source.width needs to be the actual size of the texture. In this case, we're just gonna hard code it in for now. Then source.height equals 32 as well. <sighs> Again, there goes the pump, our nice little friend who just 
won't quit you just won't okay now what we can do is we can pass in the memory address of the source sdl rect into our sdl render copy so if you head f7 let's compile and run it see what happens we get the exact same thing so why is that that's because this is our source. So this isn't the destination. The source just explains exactly how big the texture is and where you want to start rendering. Now to actually change any of this and make anything happen, we have to create another SDL underscore rect, and that is our destination. So the final output. And if we go source.x equals zero, and then source.y equals zero as well, we're gonna render it in the top left-hand corner of the screen. And then source dot width equals 32 source or why am i saying source goodness what are we doing we gotta go s uh, dst for dis destination dst i don't know what it is about us programmers but we love our abbreviations abbreviations just keep these engines chugging the so dst dot h equals 32 come on 32 there we go control save hit f7 we'll notice that it's not working but we get an error that says or a warning that says hey warning variable dst set but not used um maybe that's a problem is what it's trying to tell us and you know what it's right c plus plus is a, has a very valid point we we've created this dst we've got it all ordered it's like it's like as if we filled our car at walmart pushed it to the checkout and then just left it there that doesn't make any sense let's actually use it by giving the our sdl render copy function the memory address of that de destination as well control save it and hit f7 and see what happens now oh something different so now we see that this actually renders properly in the top left hand corner of the screen now what if we try something interesting and change our destination.x to be something like 400x on the x plane and then 300 or 200 pixels down so 400 400 pixels to the right and 200 pixels down so hmm, this is interesting that we could definitely use this to our advantage and this provides us with a basic way to manipulate our, our textures so that we can draw them where exactly we want one more interesting thing we can do is if we multiply our destination width by a scalar of any kind doesn't matter let's just say by four so we multiply our width and both our height by four Control save, hit F7 to compile and run it. We'll get, hey, we just zoomed in by four. Our entity class is going to in some way manipulate these values. So to create the entity class, go control in, in that new document type, hashtag pragma once. That's the very first thing you do in any header file. And the reason why is you only want this header file to be copied in once per other file that includes it. Control shift save, let's save it in our go into include and save it as entity with a capital E dot HPP. And the HTTP extension means that it's a C++ header file. While we're at it, go control in and then go control shift save on the new document. Save that into not include uh, source. We go into source, we call this entity dot CPP, hit enter. Go back to entity.hpp and now type hashtag include and open some angular brackets and then go sdl2 forward slash sdl.h. So we are going to use some of the functionalities of sdl. Therefore, we want to include sdl and you can copy and paste that control V and then just edit sdl to go sdl underscore image.h. Hit enter and now let's actually create ourselves a class. To do that, all you do is just type the class keyword in C++. Give it a name, doesn't matter what, we're going to call it entity and the entity is basically it's the building block for all the drawable things in our game so everything that can be rendered to the screen will be an entity of some kind hit enter open up some curler curler braces yeah curler braces and then end that curler brace the final curler brace end it with a semicolon so what exactly is a class a class is essentially a bundle of data it's a bundle of variables so inside the class you can have well, it depends. Let's go with a private field. In the private field, we can have an integer. We can have, we can have, let's say, int x and int y. Actually, we'd want to use a float x, which is different than an integer because it has floating point precision. Float x and y. So just like that, we've created a class called entity. We've created a data type entity. Actually, classes are data types. Similar to how you have an integer data type, like somewhere out there, there's a class int 
and that's actually defined by Stevles plus for us. So somewhere out there, there's a class called an integer. With it comes a few functions. Most of them are just operators that are overloaded. Think of classes as essentially a bundle of data and a way to treat that data. A class has a few attributes or maybe a lot of attributes, depends on what you want to go with. And attributes members, you call them the same thing. And then in the public field, usually it's done. You have functions that can access and fiddle around with the attributes or the members. So that's essentially what it is. I mean, if we went to main.cpp and scrolled to the top and went hashtag include entity dot HPP. And then we scrolled down right after we created our grass texture and we hit enter and we went entity Bob, just like so entity Bob. We've done nothing more at this point than just go float X, Y. That's all we've done here, except we've given these a nice little name with Bob X and Bob Y. That's all I do. Classes, just think of it like a factory that creates a collection of data. It creates a collection of floats, integers, textures, whatever it is you want. It's just a container that holds some variables. So that's all it is. Now an object is what a class creates. So a class, think of it like a factory, and then the object is what the factory produces. Now, structs, what are structs? Uh, let's just take that out a second. A struct is exactly the same as a class except for one small thing and structs are declared like so, very similar. If you go struct entity to t, I have some troubles today talking. Okay, so we go struct entity, it looks very similar, but the only difference is by default, it's public. The default field is public. So we could go int x int y, like so. And then we could access the, if we went, let's say in the main function, we created an entity and we called it E, then we could go E dot X equals five or 55 and then E dot Y equals 66. If you remember from the episode before last, you cannot access variables that are in classes that are marked as private. So you'll see that in our class entity, we've got this flow X and Y, but they're private. So this means only the entity itself, only the functions inside entity, like say, let's say a void move, only those functions inside of the entity class can actually edit these attributes. So by default, when you create a class, the default access specifier is private. So by default, everything is private unless you actually say public. However, the reverse is with a struct. With a struct, it's a public by default. So that's all there is to classes, really. Not too much to really worry about for now. Later, we'll get into polymorphism and inheritance. We're not going to worry about that for now. To best describe inheritance, just think of it like you're classes in code having children. Maybe that's not a good idea. Um, think of it like a family tree. You inherit certain genes. That's kind of how it works. We'll get into more of that later, but that's just a very, very brief explanation. We're going to create a public field in our entity, public, and we're going to create a private field as well, private. So inside private, for now, we're just going to take two doubles, not floats, two doubles, and they're going to be X and they're going to be Y. So this X and Y is the actual position of where our entity is going to be on the screen. If you're dealing with a 3D game, you would have another field called Z. And that is how far away it is. So X is along the X plane, which is left to right. And the Y is along the Y plane, which is up and down. Technically speaking, we should throw this into a vector class later, but that's going to make this video really long. And Rome wasn't built in a day. It was built in an hour if you're a programmer. So we got our double X and Y. Now, why is it a double and not a float? The reason is, I was actually having a glitch with my implementation of floating point arithmetic. Um, there's a certain problem with the function, which is F mod, which returns a floating point modulus. So we're gonna go with doubles until further specified. You could try it without a float. I don't know if your implementation might be different, but on Linux, I was having a few errors with that. But I went with doubles and it was going to be fine. So what is a double exactly? A double is exactly like a float. What is a float? A float is a number that has a point in it. So 0.0, .0 is a float. Uh, 0.1 is a float. A double. What's a double? Well, a double is exactly like a float, except it has more memory. So a float can only go to this point. Let's say this point here. I don't exactly remember what. Well, a double has double the memory, therefore double the precision. So we could go 32 dot. Well, we could go even further. So we got more accuracy. We got our two doubles, X and Y. Later, that'll become our own vector. Hit enter and go SDL underscore rect. So we're going to create an SDL rect, which is just a collection of integers. And we're going to call this here our frame, our current frame. This will come in handy for animation later on, but it'll also work just fine for dealing with our tiles that aren't actually 
animating. So inside public, we're going to create something called a constructor, which a constructor, all you got to do is just type the name of the class, throw in a couple parentheses, and then end it with a semicolon. So what exactly is a constructor? A constructor is a function, just like if we had a function called initialize. It's exactly the same, except it's a special case function because it gets called whenever you create an entity class. So whenever you go entity E, so whenever you create an instance of the entity class, or whenever you create an entity object, it automatically calls this entity constructor right there. So that's why it's called the constructor. It runs by default or as soon as you initialize. We're gonna give our constructor two parameters. The first is a double and we're gonna call it P underscore X. The P underscore just means this is a parameter. It's a naming convention that I like to adhere to. It just makes things a lot clearer. So comma, then double P underscore Y. And the one final parameter and that is STL underscore texture pointer and we're going to call this our p underscore texture oh and take out that void in it we do not need that we're going to need to add one more private class member variable and that is a sdl underscore texture pointer which if you remember from the last episode a sdl texture pointer is just a the memory address of where a texture is currently living on our graphics card if we don't have a graphics card on our ram and we're going to call this texture or just text, we can call it text, we can abbreviate because we love to abbreviate, we're programmers. Control save that, go to entity.cpp. The first thing we need to do here is just go hashtag include, open quotes, and then entity.hpp. Now, when we include this entity.hpp, if we check out entity.hpp, it's gonna copy everything and then paste it right into entity.cpp. So we don't need to re-include these SDL2, SDL.h, and the SDL image libraries, but I actually do like to re-include them twice just so that I know exactly which libraries I'm dealing with in any particular C++ source file. It's up to you, you don't have to, it's completely optional. So now if you're wondering, why is it we have a HPP file and why is it we have a .cpp file? Well, the reason is we're gonna create a function here and it's our constructor, so entity, and then two colons entity. Again, so we're saying part of the entity class and it's a function called entity. Open up some parentheses. The reason is, is we've got this wonderful function right here that doesn't do much but if we try and run it from main.cpp, main.cpp will have no idea where that function it is. It needs some way of knowing that there that the function at least exists. So that's why we have this .hpp file. The .hpp file just basically says, hey, there's a function and it's called entity and it takes these parameters. That's all it does. It just says it's out there. It's up to the link to find it. That's all it does. So go to entity.cpp and we'll keep coding. We need to have the right parameters for this particular function, which is a double P underscore X and then a double P underscore Y and then a SDL underscore texture pointer P underscore text. So that's where we're going to leave today's episode. I hope you enjoyed. If you have any questions or comments, just let me know down below. Thank you for watching and, sub and subscribing. Code like, and I will see you next video. Microphone book, get your microphone book to do. Everybody enjoys laughing. It alleviates stress and makes a long day a little bit brighter. But the problem is not everything that claims to be funny actually is funny. And that's why I have solid gold nuggets like McVan Buck. McVan Buck Trophy Mosquito is a prelude to a bigger McVan Buck book that is written by my dad, Peter N. Mast. It's a humor book and it's filled with three humorous stories that are hilarious. They're hilarious to read, very entertaining. Let's open this up and have a little read. Warden Art was not impressed with our story at all. In fact, he was downright angry. He hissed through his teeth, Why did you shoot that bear? A sow grizzly is off limits for shooting, period. And with cubs, it's unacceptable. As he snatched this paper stapler off his desk. We were drilled by Art Warden Art for the next 20 minutes with little drops of spit hitting us in the faces from time to time. I was too scared to give the Warden a tissue to wipe the spit off of his chin. I looked over at Max as he sat slunk down in his chair, his face as white as a ghost, and his eyes cast to the floor in shame. So you're probably wondering, how can I get this wonderful McVan Buck book? I'm doing a McVan Buck giveaway. All you gotta do is send your full name and mailing address to kotogopher at gmail.com and you'll win a free McVan Buck Trophy Mosquito. They're flying off the shelves, so get them while they last. Two people now have asked for them. These things are selling like hotcakes.